initiative is laudable. Last year, from what I heard, he had 130 applicants, out of which 30 were chosen as fellows. This year, the number jumped to 638 applicants, 350 of whom were chosen as fellows. It is laudable. In the mid-1990s, I was in a hotel in South Africa, and I overheard a young Nigerian with his friends talking about Banjul. He said, have you ever been to Banjul? And his friend said, no. <laughs> and he said, it's just like a big village, nothing there. It is just like a big village. There is nothing in Banjul. I was so ashamed. I wanted to put my head under the table, I couldn't. I wanted to walk out, I couldn't. I was afraid if I stood up, they would say Nangadef, as it happens to me often, because people think I'm Senegalese from my height. So I just looked at the young man in the face and said, young man, be careful. There's somebody from that big village just next to you. I saw his face change, and he apologized. I said, apologies accepted. I know that you just reporting the facts. Many years later on, I met another Nigerian. In the conversation, he asked me where I came from, and I said, the Gambia. And I saw his face lit. The Gambia, he said. There is a Gambian who has built a mini city in Port Harcourt. Do you know him? I said, of course, yeah, I know him. He's uh, like a brother to me. He said, this incredible guy. Do you know him? I said, yes, I know him very well. Similarly, about six years ago, I went to Swaziland and I was received by a group of ministers, among whom was the Minister of Works. And she told me that she had been to the Gambia and told me, Karamo, I was so impressed, so impressed. And I asked why. <laughs> she said, because my driver took me on a tour and I saw some really beautiful estate development projects. And I was told that they were by a man called Mustafa. Can you convince Mustafa to come to Swaziland? Now a Swatini. Ladies and gentlemen, gathered here today, especially the young ones, I would like to ask us to celebrate each other's success. I would like us to encourage each other in progress. I would like us to be happy in each other's happiness. That is the first thing I would like to say before we get started with our topic today, which is good leadership. Good leadership, as President Mandela put it, a good leader, he said, is like a shepherd. He stays behind the flock, letting the most nimble go ahead, where upon the others follow, not realizing that all along they are being directed from behind. That, according to Mandela, may his soul rest in peace, is good leadership. Today, in order to structure our discussion, I would be asking a number of questions. Questions are very good because it helps us in the thought process, and it helps us to target the answers directly. Today, we're going to have about six questions with us. First of all, what is the vision, that vision of the chairman, that's Karamo as the chairman of the Tough Africa Group, not as the chairman of the Tough Africa Foundation, which is Alani Mustafa himself, but of the group. What is my vision for Tough Black? First question. Second question, what are the qualities of a good leader? Third question, who are the four friends? What I would call the four friends and the eight enemies of a good leader. For what are the four conditions that enhance good leadership? And what are the four conditions which inhibit good leadership? Five, as future leaders, and I'm directly addressing the Tafla Fellows here today, as future leaders of our motherland, the Gambia, what are your biggest tasks? Finally, what are the five neighbors from our recent history? These questions would be addressed in the following minutes. But before I go on to address these questions, I would like to know that it's after 11 o'clock at night here. So if I should fall asleep, do not hesitate. If you have a drum near you, start beating the drum.
syndrome to wake me up. If all of a sudden, what is my vision of Tafla as the group chairman? My vision is that Tafla would emerge as the leading center in the Gambia to foster a spirit of oneness. Today in Gambia, there's something we need more than anything else from what I've been getting from social media and friends and relatives. It is called oneness. We must see each other as one, one people. And I expect and I hope that Tafla would foster the spirit among you young men and women today listening to me and among the rest of society. Secondly, I hope that Tafla would generate a sense of public service. The Gambia needs young men and women who would not only be thinking about themselves, but who would be thinking beyond themselves, even beyond their immediate families. Young men and women who would be thinking about their extended families, their relatives, who would be thinking about their region, who would be thinking about their country and past even beyond their countries. I would like to see Tafla promote good leadership and governance in the Gambia through you. I would like to see Tafla inculcate a, a spirit of entrepreneurship among you. Our generation went to school hoping and dreaming that we would end up working for government, putting on suits and sitting on, in a nice office, collecting a salary. That was our dream. Some of us dreamt to work for the United Nations. We know that today, not everybody can work. And in fact, it's not a good idea for everybody to work for government, nor can everybody work for the United Nations. The future of the world and the future of Africa indeed lies in the private sector. This is where the opportunities are. This is where the energies are needed the most. So I am hoping that you are going to think more and more private sector, creating jobs, becoming independent, rather than going to school, and hoping and dreaming, as our generation did, that one day you'd end up working for government or the United Nations, being taken care of somebody instead of taking care of somebody. I do hope that Tafla would help you young people benefit from the experience of your elders. We must not forget, in as much as we encourage the young, that the center of our society and our future must emerge from the memories of our elders. We must never forget them. Once we forget our elders, we would be a lost nation. And you have seen in many places where there, have, there has been tremendous economic progress, but the elders are not given the attention that they should. And it causes so many problems that we are not here today to address. I do hope that Tafla would help you young people to understand the positive traditional values which keep us smiling in spite of our problem in our society. That you would not forget these values. You would always remember these values that has kept us going, that has helped us survive colonialism, that has helped us survive slavery, that has helped us survive trauma and the so many trials and tribulations over the millennia. And I'm hoping, finally, that Tafla would help you young people avoid the pitfalls of life and recognize the requirements of real success. Real success is what I am talking about. Going to the qualities of a good leader. What are the qualities of a good leader? First is strength. A good leader has to be strong. You have to be strong. You cannot be a leader and you are weak. You have to be strong. What does that do for you if you are strong? It grants you decisiveness. Strength grants you command and control. A good leader has to be determined. Determination grants you endurance. A good leader has to be patient. Patience also grants you endurance. A good leader has to be objective. Objectivity grants you respect because people say he's objective. He's objective. Our CEO is objective. Our president is objective. Our chief, our governor is objective. They say that. And I've been fortunate in my travels 
to have met so many heads of states and ministers, I mean generals, war heroes. I've met billionaires, I've met chiefs, I've met CEOs, worked with CEOs, including my present one, whom I consider as the best CEO in the world, whom I've worked for, with, for, for about 20 years. I'm sorry, Alaji Mursafa. <laughs> I'll put you almost on the same level. <laughs> I worked with him for about 20 years, and I consider him as the best CEO in the world. But uh, in you, he certainly would find his match. I have met all these people and I've observed. <coughs> found in them that ob being objective grants the leader respect. Fairness, which is related to objectivity, also grants the leader respect. Industry, hardworking. If the leader is hardworking, it gives him dignity. It helps him achieve results, progress. It gives him an exemplary behavior, wisdom. A leader must be wise. You cannot be a leader and you are not wise. You must be wise. You have to be in order to be a good leader. That wisdom grants you guidance, respect, creativity, and continuity. I'll tell you the story of Solomon. I believe some of you know the story of Solomon. Two mothers came to Solomon with one baby. Each of them claimed that the baby belonged to her. Everybody looked around, wondering how on earth Solomon would solve this problem. Solomon called them and asked one of his guards to bring a sword. He said, bring me a sword. I will cut the baby into two, and each of the mothers would have her. The moment Solomon said that, one of the mothers said, yes, fantastic. You, indeed, you are, are wise. The other mother said, no, 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 no. I don't want the baby to be hurt. Or rather, she takes the baby. Solomon says, I know who is the mother of this baby. And they handed the baby over to the true mother. That is called wisdom. Each time the leader is stuck, he finds a way out. It grants him continuity. A leader must be for all. When the leader is for all instead of a minority, a leader must not be for Mandinkas alone. No. A leader must not be for the fullers alone. No, the leader must not be for the jollers alone. No, for the Manjakos, no. A leader must not be for the Muslims alone. No, he must not be for the Christians alone. No, a leader must be for all. Being for all grants the leader respect, love, popularity, and cooperation. In 1982, I met a young lady in a valley at a university. We stood, sat next to each other for more than two hours whilst waiting for our papers to be processed on our first day to start our university education. She told me who she was and told me about herself, about her mother, and about her father. I've never had a lecture, a political science lecture, more illuminating as I did that day with that young lady. She told me about the terrible experience that her family and herself were experiencing. And she told me about commitment, about leadership. She told me about oppression and injustice. We parted ways and she went back to her country, promising to come back in a week and contacting me after her return. I never, ever so met her again. I found out later that at the border on her way back home, she was oppressed, arrested by the repressive arm of the apartheid regime. And she never made back to that little beautiful country where we met in a valley called Swaziland. I have never met this lady again. 32 years later, I walked into the house of a South African white family, and I saw a picture on the wall of a man whom I recognized immediately. 
And the face of that man looked just exactly like that young lady whom I met 32 years ago at the University of Swaziland. The young lady was called Zinzi. Mandela was her family name. And the man whose photograph was up there was Nelson Mandela. And under the photograph, a note to the wife, white family in whose house I was saying, compliments to my wonderful friends for your inspiration in the building of a new South Africa. That was Nelson Mandela who sacrificed about 27 years of his life fighting for justice for the black people of South Africa, writing a note to white subjects. Because he, as you know, became president. Mandela has passed on, left this world. Zinzi Mandela, whom I met at the University of Swaziland, I just learned, has also passed on to the next world. She died as ambassador of South Africa to Sweden this week. Mandela was a leader for all. And he embodies all the qualities that I've mentioned here today. Next, we need to talk about, sorry, it's not going, the screen is not, the slide is not going, I'm sorry. The slide is not going. There's a technical problem, I'm afraid. Are you hearing me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yes. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yes, we're we are hearing you loud and clear. We're hearing you loud and clear. Now the okay, slides are going now. Okay, thank you. We spoke about the qualities of a good leader. Now let us go on to talk about those whom I call the four friends of a good leader. If one of you should end up president of Gambia today, you young men, fellows, or one of the young ladies, who should you consider your friend as president of the Gambia? I have got four people whom you should be looking around, looking at around you to know whether you should consider them your friends or not. The first person is the person who always tell you the truth. This is very important. The, truth, the truthful advisor, friend, wife, assistant, cook, whatever. Anybody who's around you and is he or she is truthful, consider him or her your friend because he tells you the truth and the truth can only benefit. Second, the honest, which is related to being truthful. The honest, the person around you who is honest with you, you should consider your friend. The informative, the person who gives you all the information you need, not part of the information, but he gives you some of the, all the information so you can make the right decision. Often our leaders don't have all the information, so they end up making wrong decisions. So if you should end up president of the Gambia and you have somebody around who's always give you all the information when it comes to decision making, he gives you all the choices. This person you should consider your friend. The protective. He loves you as president or CEO or manager or his chief or governor. He loves you. He wants to protect you. This is extremely important because he doesn't want you to get into trouble. If you're about to fall into a hole, he'll tell you, watch out, watch out. There's a hole in front of you. Consider him your friend. On the other hand, as a leader, you would have double the number of enemies. Unfortunately, it is difficult for most leaders to actually tell who are their enemies because their enemies are formidable. First is the liar, the liar. If you are the CEO of a company and the person who always come to you and lie and lie and lie, consider him your worst enemy. He's lying and he's misleading you. Same thing as president or governor or king. If you have an advisor who is always lying, be very careful about him. Second is the hypocrite. The hypocrite, the hypocrite wants 
to spoil your relationship with everybody. How do you know a hypocrite? Each time he comes to you, try to find out if he talks about somebody. That's how you know about a hypocrite. He's somebody, your advisor, your friend, or whoever it is, every time he comes talks about somebody, then be very careful about him. He's the hypocrite. He is your second enemy. Third enemy is the pretender. He pretends he loves you. He's your friend. He's your best. And he convinces you. He sweet talks you, but he's only pretending. This is deadly. He is your third enemy. You must know him if you are president or governor or army general or CEO, manager, et cetera, et cetera. The fourth one is the provocative. He makes you angry. He makes you angry. He makes you angry. Who are you and I hate to use those words. I never do. He comes and tells you words that will make your body hot. He gets you angry. He heats you up. He pumps you up. He's the provocative. You, you must watch out. He is your enemy. He makes you, wants to make you fight with everybody, even your friends. Be very careful if you are president or governor or king or whatever it is. The person who always comes to you and provoke you, make you provoke and make you angry with people, be very careful. Then the greedy, he's just around you for his own interest or her own interest. Be very careful. How do you know? He'll come to you, talk very nicely. After some time, he will raise a material need. <laughs> be very, very careful about the greedy advisor, greedy friend, greedy servant, greedy officer, greedy who's around it. He's your enemy, and you must know it. You can tell by what he says. Every time he feels you are happy with him, he will come up with a demand. This is how you know that he is greedy and he's your enemy. Then the envious. The envious related to the hypocrite because the envious doesn't also like people around you. Each time you seem to like somebody, he'll come and tell you bad things about him. So there's hypocrisy and envy. They go together for us. So be very, very careful about the envious. He will make your people who love you, he will make you hate them. He'll make enemies out of friends. The overly submissive, H-E or lie H-E, ah, H-E. You tell him you are black, he said yes. When the minister says to, to him you are tall, even if he's short, he said yes. And if, if the minister tells him you are short and you are tall, but he's tall, he still say yes because he doesn't listen. He's just there to say yes, 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 yes. That's the overly submissive. He's not your friend. So in whatever leadership position you are, be careful about it. Finally, you have the evil soothsayer. The evil soothsayer or the magician is your enemy if you are a leader in any position. Why is he your enemy? He'll come near you and say, be careful. You see that tall man there, a bit fair, a bit slim? Be careful. Be very careful. He's the one who is going to take your job. Oh, you see that army general? Be careful. He's plotting a coup d'etat. I have known a woman who's fantastic all my life, wonderful woman. One day, she sent me a letter. She sent me a letter completely depressed because her whole family accused her of being a witch because a magician, a soothsayer, told the family that she ate the first son of her own brother. And the four, whole family decided to boycott her. You have to be very careful. Those of you who read the Quran and the, and the Bible, you know the story of Moses. The magician went to him and said, there's a baby coming, and that baby is the one who is going to get rid of you. And he decided, Pharaoh, decided to go and kill the babies, all the babies. But he missed the one God had this time, would be Moses, who would save the Jews, and it happened. The magician would frighten you, will get you into extreme action, and like the hypocrite and the envious will make you many, many enemies and try to 
distort your destiny and the destiny of others. Next, we go to the conditions that enhance good leadership and the conditions that inhibit them. It. I have four conditions here. These conditions are number one, economic progress. If your economy is growing, all right, people are finding jobs, okay? Exports are growing. The investment is coming in. People are happy with you if you're the head of state or if the minister of finance in the company, the people are happy. The jobs are coming, wages are increasing. Economic progress enhances good leadership. It's on the positive side. Equity. People feel that depending on their circumstances, the leader, the head of state, the minister, governor, who, or whoever it is. And I'm not talking about a particular leader here. I'm talking about leaders in general, in politics as well as in, economy, in the economy. If they feel that they are being treated equally according to the circumstances, this is favorable to you. It's favorable for good leadership. Then there is justice. When there is justice in the nation, the same thing. People feel they've got good leaders. When there's justice in a company, people feel they have good leaders. In a region, people feel they have a good governor. Security, when there's security in a country, people are happy. They are very happy. They credit the government for the security. They can sleep anywhere. They can go anywhere. Security is good for good leadership. Now, on the negative side, what are the conditions that inhibit good leadership? Economic crisis, people cannot find jobs. Inflation is hitting the roof, etc. Economic crisis. When there's economic crisis in a country, it's very difficult for people to praise their leaders. Inequity. Inequity, when they feel that, depending on their circumstances, they are not being treated equally or fairly. The isms, what do I mean by the isms? Tribalism. Racism, regionalism, all these issues make it difficult. They inhibit good leadership. If the, your leader is tribalist, he's going to appeal to only a section of your population. Same thing, if your CEO is a tribalist in the company, he's going to be promoting only people from his tribe. If he's a racist, he's only going to be promoting and giving attention to those who have the same skin color. And you know what's happening in the world today, I don't have to tell you about George Floyd in America, you all know what's going on now. Tribalism is an evil, racism is an evil, all forms of discrimination which pit one race or one tribe against each other, one region against each other, favor one over the other, they are all evil and they cannot be promoted by a leader at the same time that leader expects that the people are going to love and they're going to respect. Any good leader anywhere at any level must make sure that the isms, the isms are completely discouraged among his or her followers. In security, if people cannot go outside, if people cannot go to the mosque and pray, People cannot go to the cinemas. People cannot go to the restaurant. People cannot go to their job. People cannot go at night. There's insecurity. It's very difficult for people to respect and to love and to praise their leaders. Insecurity is one thing that inhibits good leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, especially the young fellows of Tafla. I am now going to move on to the question of, as future leaders of the Gambia, or motherland, what do you consider to be your biggest tasks? This question is not an easy one because it has many, many answers and I've thought deep about it. And I came up with three things that I thought could, that I thought reflects the positive sides of the three republics we have had since independence. In any situation, I try to look at the positive side. And I looked at each of the republics 
and I try to look at what was or might have or seemed to be the positive side. And by the way, I have not lived in Gambia for decades, but I don't know whether I've said this in the beginning or not. I have met every Gambian head of state since high school. I have met and I have sat down with every single Gambian head of state, starting from Jawara, Jamme, and Baro. I have met and I have sat down with each of them. In answering this question, trying to be fair, as somebody who has no political interest, anybody who knows me will confirm this with you, to you. I have looked at each republic and tried to fairly bring out the three tasks which I feel that you young men at Tafla and the rest of Gambian society must consider your biggest task. From the first republic, you must strive to revive the peace, the security, the satisfaction, and the mutual understanding among Gambians. Satisfaction is very important. Somebody can be poor but dignified. Poverty is terrible without dignity, without satisfaction. That's what makes it terrible. Gambia, when I was young, Gambians were satisfied, and that's why they were among the happiest people in the world. That's why they were among the best people in the world. Gambians were special, and I still remember those fantastic Gambians, hospitable. They sit around a bowl of rice, 10 people, small bowl. Everybody will take maybe one handful to three handful. They smile and get up, and they are happy. It was in their stomachs, but consideration for others. They're satisfied with little and happy. You may get a billion dollars, you are miserable. You may get $100 a month, and you are happy. That satisfaction existed in our society, and it exceeded, existed especially in the First Republic when I was at high school and earlier. So I would like you young people, if you should become leaders in the Gambia, to strive to bring that peace, security, satisfaction, and mutual understanding among Gambians back, 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 that made us special in the world. Second, the Second Republic. I would like you to embark, if you find yourself in the right position, on the expansion of the infrastructure building that took place in the Second Republic. But it must be transparent. It must be transparent. Every nation needs infrastructure. A nation cannot develop without infrastructure. As I told you, a young man was laughing at us because we didn't have infrastructure. And I met another gentleman from the same country who praised us because he was so impressed. And a minister from a kingdom who also praised us. Infrastructure is extremely important. We need to expand on whatever might have been built in the Second Republic, but it has to be done transparently, not under the table. Finally, what is it that you should get from the Third Republic and build upon it? The Third Republic had babies. These babies were born after the 2016 elections. What are these babies? The dreams and the aspirations of the Gambian people after the 2016 elections. I refer to these as the babies, the dreams and aspirations. When I stood up in 2017, December, and I warned the Gambian nation, I was hoping that people would listen to me. It seemed nobody listened to me. And people come to me and say, Karam, what you have said is all happening. And I'm saddened about that because I didn't intend for it to happen. I was warning the nation, hope that they would hear the warning and make sure that it didn't happen. Now, you young men in particular, but not only you, in particular, I have to make sure that those babies that are here crying when I go to bed every night because their mothers have abandoned them, you must bring those babies back. That is your third major task. You cannot fulfill those three tasks, national obligations, unless you are able to do certain things. 
unless you are able to develop a spirit, a very special, special spirit to embark on those three tasks. Now, what is that special spirit? Where would the motivation come from? If I were to ask you, you pass would scratch your head and wonder how on earth can we get the answers to this question? That special spirit that we need for a truly new Gambia, driving the, the, the best of the three republics, putting them together, driving from the best out of each of the three republics, putting them together and creating the new Gambia, the desired Gambia that we all want. In order to develop that spirit, you have to look at our recent history over the last 20 years. It is very easy. Look at the testimonies at the TRRC. It's very easy. Read the reports of the TRRC. It is very easy. What do you see? I hate to say it. Nobody loves this country more than me. I am a griot for this Gambian, and you may not know it, but I'm actually a griot for Gambia. You may not know it. I am. Ask any foreign friend of mine close to me. He'll tell you that I sing songs about the Gambia. One day, my kids told me, Daddy, be careful. You always speak so highly of Gambia. People go to Gambia and they get disappointed. I'm afraid that's happened. If I were to tell you my experience, you'd be very shocked. I've sent many years somewhere disappointed, but I love my country and I love my people. And I was shocked when I see, when I hear a Gambian saying, another Gambian take a bayonet and put in the stomach of another Gambian. I cannot believe it the brutality that took place in our country over the last 20 years. I am shamed. Some of you who've been looking at my posts, LinkedIn and Facebook, sometimes I'm sad, sometimes I'm miserable, sometimes I'm angry, because I have sung songs about how fantastic we are as Gambian, how humane we are as Gambian. The brutality that took place in the last 20 years, anybody want to deny it, something must be wrong. And we must all be ashamed. I'm not a politician. I don't care about politics. I am not pointing fingers at anybody. Everybody knows the facts. I don't have to tell you. You young men and the rest of society must be able to stand up and say, never shall I kill my fellow Gambian brother again. Never. It must never happen. Unless you commit yourself to this, we are wasting our time. It's going to happen. We'll never be able to go over our history, our terrible, bloody red history. The first thing you must tell, tell yourself, never shall I kill my Gambian brother, never. That is the first of the five nevers never that you that must commit yourself to. Every Gambian must commit yourself to that. What is the second never? There are five nevers. Never shall I rape my sister my fellow Gambian, and I'm not, when I say sister and brother, I'm not talking about somebody from the same mother and father and blood. They are safe in your hands, but we have seen others are not safe. But every Gambian is your brother, sister, more, fuller, Mandiago, Mandinka, Christian, whatever it is. Even if it doesn't come from the same religion, as if it doesn't subscribe to the same religion, it's still your fellow Gambian, your compatriot. It's your brother in humanity, a creation of God Almighty. So when I say brother and sister, that's what I meant. You must commit yourself to saying, never shall I rape my Gambian sister. Never. It's a shame on the nation. When a young girl who might have been a daughter to any of us, or a little sister to any of us, comes up and say, I have been raped by who? By who? That shame goes over the whole nation. Even if she is not telling the truth, because you must know something. For every woman in this world who steps out and say, I have been raped, maybe there's 10 or 100 or 1,000 who do not have the courage to come out and say, I have been raped. The worst thing for a human being is to kill him or, or her. But for a woman, rape is equally bad. So we must commit ourselves. Especially you young people, if you find yourself in the position tomorrow, you must say, never shall I rape my sister, never. Number three, 
never shall I steal public funds or misuse public funds to entrench my position in power or support my leaders to do so, never. This never is in two parts. First, it says, I will not steal public funds. That's you. You will not misuse them. That is you. You know, I have noticed something in Gambia. They seem to praise people who steal money. People come with stolen monies. We know each other's salary. And if you somebody build a mansion, you know it's not coming from his salary. It's not coming from his party. And where is he coming from? And nobody cares. They praise him. They go to him. Somebody told me that of a particular person who stole, who stole so much money, everybody knew. Even the imams who went to read the Quran for him in his house, the moment he took the packets of money out, they forgot the Qurans. They were fighting over the money. This is terrible. This is terrible. Where is our faith, fellow Gambians? Where? Where? Somebody still sleeping, stealing money, and you know he's stealing, and you are still praising songs. I walk into a bank, a bank manager told me about somebody I wouldn't mention. He said he's such a good man, he's used his own money to finance my daughter abroad. He's not a businessman, he's a politician. Where is he getting that money from? Tell me the truth. Sell from his salary? From what? Ask yourself that question. The second part, I will not support my leaders to do so. I heard when President Barrow came from Dakar to take over, people were making fun of him. They said, the president before used to give us hundreds of thousands of dollars. This man is only giving people, I don't know, five dollars or one thousand dollars. This news came to my ears. And I said, this is terrible. You are telling the man to also start behave, behaving like the one before. Before, And if he starts beh behaving like the one before, are you going to accuse him of corruption? Because what? You expect him to give as much. And he knows part of his legitimacy is his ability to give you as much. If he puts his hands in the till, you are going to be responsible. You cannot be singing songs, abusing him, insulting him left, right, and center. You encourage him. And I see if in the media people go and say it. And I have, I have, I have heard it so many times at the highest level. HE gave me this. HME gave me this. President Olen Sonina. President Olen, yeah, President, President gave me this. President gave me this. Where is he getting it from? I'm sorry to say it. Even if I become president of Gambia today and I start dishing money out of you from the coffers, where do I get? Unless it's from my businesses before I become president, ladies and gentlemen. So you have to be careful. You have a responsibility not to abuse public funds and you must not encourage the leaders. If you expect the president's wife to, to give you money when you go to him, is it wrong that he has? she has her own foundation or seek to have her own wife? It is the values that must change. It's the values that must change to bind the leaders. And we have our role and our part to play. Number four, never shall I support corruption. That's related to what I just said. Never. Finally, never shall I judge a fellow Gambian on any basis except his or her character. Forget about tribalism. Forget about regionalism. We are a poor country. Life expectancy about, about 60. Life expectancy about, at birth. Our budget, where is it financed from? Look at our total external debt. Look at our debt service ratio. Look at our infant mortality rate. Look at our GDP. Our total GDP is less than $2 billion. There are more than a 1,000 individuals in this world who have, as individuals, more money than the Gambia. Individuals have got more money than the entire Gambia. Let us build our economy and forget about tribalism. We are fighting over poverty. It doesn't make sense, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't make sense. We are too small, a nation, too small, about 2 million. Take the Mandinkas and put them aside. Put the Fulas aside. Put the Manjagos, put the Wolof aside. You think any of us can turn that country around? and make it an Eldorado. No, we need each other. And it's a big shame, I hate to say this in English, more fingolo than malakanyo fatang fans. 
dunia bibe jellandel hanna treta ta world bank le world bank i don't care phd from harvard mo fingol discrimination is there ndol da mal kam nyoto ni nato ta ta america ta ta europe yam mo mol bab la nyim mo flol di woni mo mandin college nyim mo jolale nyim mo nyinet jolale mo ne na faaso do me alon ko in the last 20 years me alon ko jolale se mo fa mo la mo la kula o mandin ko lu o flol alaji be bani sanji mo mo wa everybody is responsible mandin ka sa responsible Jolas are responsible. Fulas are responsible. Everybody participated in the bloodshed. We are collectively responsible. And if there was tribalism, and I agree there was tribalism, because one smart man decided to fool an entire nation, including PhD holders and intellectuals who today believe in tribalism. Let us forget about tribalism. You will never go to heaven because you are Mandinka or Fula or Jola or white man or even Arab is in our religion. It's your character. Let's hold each other and move the Gambia forward. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, stop tribalism, stop racism, stop spiteful nation, nationalism in the Gambia and this war. They are brothers and sisters. Watch out for COVID. It is real. Let nobody fool you that COVID is not real. COVID is real. Take it very seriously. COVID has serious consequences for your health and for the Gambian economy. By protecting yourself and your family, you protect the Gambia and you protect Africa. Mbalde Mala Ali Sabari, Nanyo Muta Naka Kilinti, Afuaria Kele, Lukara Ali Sabari, Ali Sabari, Mandinko Ali Sabari, Flo Ali Sabari, Jolo Ali Sabari, Sulu Ali Sabari, Ali Bey Sabari, Ali Sabari, Ali Sabari, let us move forward and march. I will stop there for the moment. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sonko. That was very interesting. I must say myself, I learned a lot and I've been taking notes right here, uh, especially when you talk about uh, people who, young people should put the interest of the country first and that of the citizen. Uh, that's very important, and also to understand our traditional values, which uh, holds us together as a society. These are very, very important uh, points. But I would let uh, will, I will let Tapa the Global come in and uh, give of his take, and then I will uh, take a look at the questions that we have, if there are any. Hello, can Taf hear us? Yeah, actually, the internet is very unstable in the Gambia, and we are struggling here. I hope you can hear me. Oh, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, okay, great, great. Actually, I have some few questions from the, from the, um, uh, from the fellows. Uh, by the way, Dr. Sonko, thank you so, thank you so much for this um, lecture and presentation. I mean, I didn't want you to stop. And um, uh, there are a lot of comments from them, uh, but, but just a few questions. I'm trying to scroll down. And um, just to come up with, with the questions that we are asked. And uh, one says that, um, what's his advice? Um, um, uh, sorry, let me just uh, try and scroll here. I'm struggling with, with technology and a slow connection. Um, it says, um, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sonko. And then it says, what qualities are lacking amongst today's leaders? I think that you addressed. And then what three books can you recommend on leadership? Somebody has just asked that what three books can you recommend on leadership? Do you have any? No, uh, I don't have any particular books on leadership. I have learned what I have learned about good leadership. And if you, if you, if you notice, I, I didn't quote any 16th century philosophers. I didn't uh, <laughs> quote any leaders of the American Revolution. My experience is based, first of all, as a child. I remember the stories of my stepmother. One of these fantastic stories, if you don't mind, I can tell you. Would you like to hear a story? Tell me. Alaji Mustafa. Well, um, uh, doctor, we, we have actually, we've, we've clocked in almost uh, an hour. Yes. Can you can you hear me? 
Yes, it's up to you if you want. Yeah, the, want... the network is fluctuating here, but if you can hear yeah. me, I think we have about five to ten minutes to go. So I think we, we will hold on to those those stories. Fatu, do you have any questions for him? Okay, thank you. Uh, for here, let me check on the. Hello, uh, Fatu, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. I can hear you. I can hear you. I'll have to check on the uh, uh, on the social media and see if uh, people are putting in questions. But just to say that uh, to the listeners and uh, those watching us, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send them to us. And uh, we are talking about the qualities of leadership. And Dr. Carmo uh, talked about the need to put country first, how that is important, holding our society together. He also talked about the four friends of a leader, the good friends, and of course. Uh, the the other friends who would be people who will not tell the leader the truth. Uh, so if you have any questions, it's right here with us. Just send us your question, and uh, we will go through them and ask him. And I'm sure he'll be happy to answer your questions. So uh, Taf, if the fellows right there have questions for him, then we can start with those uh, while I look at questions on, on the social media. But uh, Alaji Mustafa, okay, then since uh, there's no time for a story, I would look for the three books on leadership. But what I was trying to tell, uh, the answer I was going to give that I have learned what I know about leadership from various sources. First, as I said, as a child, and uh, I remember a fantastic story from my stepmother, which I still remember about a leader. What's a good leader is fantastic. And uh, also my experience meeting, as I said, I've met Jawara Yame and I've met uh, Baro. And then uh, the uh, opportunity I have had in meeting heads of states, ministers, governors from around the world, you know, this has enriched me. I've met successful business people, billionaires, I've met war heroes, you know, all kinds of people I've been fortunate in my life to meet and I've learned a lot from them, plus my own positions of leadership over the years. If okay, they so want three books, I can look it up and uh, try to send you. Okay, someone is asking about a book that you wrote. Saying, ask Dr. Karamo about a book that he wrote. Um, it's like we cannot hear you now. Did, did he uh, say which book it is? No, uh, did you write books? Did you write a whole lot or? <laughs> well, I've written some, the latest book I've written is very interesting. It's about is on Islamic finance, all right? And uh, this book on Islamic finance, I have co-authors from the University of Denver. I have people writing, uh, coming from uh, Harvard and uh, major institutions, including a World Bank uh, uh, vice president and uh, some leading authorities on Islamic finance. As Muslims, we must know Islamic finance. Islam is against interest. But sadly, a lot of Muslims, most Muslim, Muslims, in fact, doing business, do business with interest. They assume it's right because they don't know. Some know, but they still do it. But most business, uh, most Muslims do not know that riba, okay, riba, Islam, sorry, considered interest as riba, it's one of the major sins of Islam. So we need to know about it as Muslims. A major sin means it's something that is not a joke, extremely serious. So our book is coming out next month, and I would encourage everybody to read it. And Islam is about fair business. That's why they're against interest. You don't have to be Muslim to see what is interest has done to the global economy. And even to the Gambian economy, just look at uh, you know, Gambia's debt service, and you see what's going on. So Islam yeah. is against it. Islam comes up with fair business that promotes economic growth, equity, etc. So this book, inshallah, would be out on the 15th of August. Okay. So I'm going to go through these uh, other two questions that I have here. The the other one, uh, oh, it, it, yeah, the other one the guy is asking, he's saying that doing such lectures uh, regularly would educate the young the younger generation. So he's asking if you would be willing uh, to do this frequently. And the other one is, if you think it is a, it's a good idea uh, for the Ministry of Education to introduce nationalism in our schools so they can teach the, the young people, the kids this. If the minister should introduce what? 
nationalism in our schools so that they can teach the kids like patriotism, the love for country, how, you know, the kids, for them to know how to love mm -hmm. your country. Quite. And sacrifice for your country. Yes, it's good. It depends on the uh, type of nationalism. You see, people forget something. It is not wrong to be proud of you are. And anybody who knows me, they'll tell you, Karamo Sonko is an extremely proud Muslim, African, black man, Gambian, Mandinka. They'll tell you this. And they will also tell you, he does not have the slightest evil feeling against a human being anywhere in the world. I have got even people I work with, people who employ me, people who consult, for, whom I consult for, who pay me money, but they know, for example, when it's time to pray, I would go and pray. I, they know it. They know that I'm a proud Gambian. They know I'm a proud black man. Everybody knows it. I have got some friends who are snow white and they know how proud I am. You have to be proud of yourself with yourself as a black man or black woman or whatever. It doesn't mean you hate other people. So nationalism should be introduced, but it's not spiteful nationalism. People have to be proud of Gambia, so they can either live in Gambia and work in Gambia, or wherever they are, they can, their heart will remain the Gambia and they continue to contribute. So yes, nationalism is a good idea, but it's okay. not the spiteful nationalism that we know of, which makes people believe their country is the best and they hate everybody and anybody who is not from that country. Okay, and here's one that's very interesting, and the person said, um, He's trying to uh, ask uh, that in a society where leadership is linked to destiny and divine ordainment, uh, what can we do as a society to change this mindset? You know how in Africa they would say, and He's asking, how are we going to be able to change this mindset? Yes, there's something called destiny. There's someone called God. I believe in that. Not everybody believes it. There is no conflict in beginning believing in God's laws and the existence of God, God and the responsibility of human beings in influencing their destiny. God gave us brains. He gave us a wonderful world. He gave us everything. He is the biggest democrat in the world. He could influence. The whole concept of God is that if you want to force you to pray 24 hours a day, he could, but he doesn't. He gives you choice, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, etc., etc. He makes us black. He made us black. Some of us are white. Some are different colors. Why did he put all this diversity? Why did he give to us? To give us choice, to realize that there is difference. Life is not just one thing. So you cannot say it's only this particular person who has been destined, des destined to rule over us. Nobody else has been destined to do so. No, I do not believe in that. Okay. And there is no conflict between the reality and existence of God and the fact that people who feel that they can come through the due process, they can come through the legal process, they can contest and they want to contest and run for presidents, your governor, or whatever in our country mm -hmm. should do so. So you shouldn't say, well, I don't believe that I, I am destined or something like that. If you feel like it, try it. Try it honorably, even if you fail. That's your right. If mm -hmm. you believe you can do a good job in it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I know we, we're getting in. Okay, uh, thank you. Fatu, Fatu, do you do you want me to come in with some questions from the fellows? Uh, yes, after this last one, because this last one is talking about how Gambia, uh, the economy was doing very well in 1965, uh, that we were in, when we had independence, that we were in a better economic situation than um, a country like Botswana. And today, for instance, Botswana is uh, the fifth richest country in Africa. So this person is saying, do you think this is because of... Uh, Bad leadership, did it play a role in our lack of economic progress? Or is it just because Africa, we do like in Gambia, we do not have a lot to offer? Just that one, and then we'll take questions from Tab. 
It's, it's a very big question. We do not have time to discuss, but there uh, are differences with Botswana, between Botswana and the Gambia. Of course, there are similarities. I've had the privilege of being Botswana in the early 1980s. I know Botswana very, very well. Like the Gambia, it has a small population. Unlike the Gambia, it's an extremely rich country. They've got diamonds, they've got cattle, they've got etc. And that there's one big difference between the Gambia and Botswana, it is stability. Botswana is a very stable country. They have managed to sustain their democracy, change presidents, and they keep on going. It is very difficult for any country to de develop in a state of economic crisis. This is the reality. It is very, very, very difficult. If you have got economic crisis, you have coup d'etats, it is difficult to have the continuity necessary to develop your country. Even if you have the, the, the largest mineral resources in the world, if there is no stability, you cannot develop a nation. If there is no good leadership, you cannot develop a nation. There are a whole lot of factors, okay? But in the case of the Gambia, I think one of our biggest problems was the lack of stability. We have had a coup d'etat. We have attempted coup d'etats. We had a lot of trauma, a lot of problems over the last 20 years. It has not been easy. And up to today, unfortunately, we have not completely come out of the woodworks. Thank you. Yes, Taf. Over to you, Taf. Thank you very much, Fatu, and thank you, um, uh, Dr. Sonko. Um, I have a question from one of the fellows, and it says, what are the steps that they can take to maintain ethical leadership? And can young people involved in politics as in part of leading and in connected to leadership? Yes, young people can get involved in the politics. They have the right to do so. We have a Gambian constitution. I know it's a new one on the way that is coming. A friend of mine actually is heading that uh, commission, very able legal expert whom I went to high school with. I think the Gambians today, even the very young know what their rights are. They know their rights and they know that if they want to get into politics, they can do so within the framework that has been outlined in the new constitution, which I don't know when they are going for a referendum. I'm not quite sure when it is, when they're going to do that. But yes, the constitution allows Gambians, I believe of a certain age, to participate in politics. That's their right. Okay, great. Another question says, um, can you please ask Dr. Sonko, who's um, his best leader? And can you summarize his or her qualities to us? I like Nelson Mandela very much. I like Nelson Mandela, and I have summarized his qualities for you, incidentally, patience. For a man to sit in jail for about 27 years, can you imagine? <laughs> 27 years. I know what it's like willingly trying to stay at home for just one 24 hours at home. I have an Australian friend who told me uh, about a month ago, he said to me in Australia, the number of suicides because of uh, staying at home has surpassed the actual number of COVID-19 deaths. People who are sitting at home got so fed up and decided to kill themselves. He said in Australia, they have more people like than, the, than those who are actually dying from COVID-19. Imagine you sitting in Robben Island in prison in South Africa, the worst prison, being insulted left, right, and center because of your beliefs and your skin color for about for more than 20 years. Mandela, I have a lot of respect for him. His committee was committed, determined, he was patient. He was almost everything, if not everything, that I mentioned on the list. And I've got a lot of respect for Mandela. Incidentally, after Mandela came, Tabo Mbeki. After Tabo Mbeki came somebody who is a brother to me. I've known for 22 years. He's one of my best friends. His name is Halima Montlante. You might not even have heard of him because of his modesty. A calm gentleman. I consider him also one of the best. And you know what? 
Nelson Mandela has the same opinion. Halema is the only human being, to my knowledge, whom Nelson Mandela has written a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic recommendation for that I know of when he took over from Becky. The same thing, modesty, modest, humble, simple guy, dedicated, etc. I have outlined all those qualities that I consider are the most important. Excellent. Um, uh, now, another one here says, um, uh, ask Dr. Sonko, in his opinion, what does he think is Gambia's biggest challenge that's hindering its development as a nation? There are a number of problems. There are a number of problems. And uh, one of which saddens me tremendously as I said, Gambians are good people. My memory of Gambia were when I was in high school. When I knew you, Al Haji Mustafa, you know, Gambians were incredible human beings. Things went wrong the last 20 years. Terribly wrong, terribly, 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 terribly wrong. And it is so, so sad. The Gambia is not a wealthy nation. But Gambians are brilliant people. Everywhere you go, you go almost in the world, you find a Gambian. Gambians are all over. Harvard Medical School, Gambians are Cambridge University, Oxford. Gambians are brilliant, brilliant. We need need to tap the intelligence of our Gambians at home as well as abroad. We really need to do something about the diaspora. When we went to uh, when we went to Belgium, I recommended the Gambia. Capacity Reinforcement Institute. I said it publicly in my speech, in my statement, and even discussed it with the minister at that time. We need to tap, tap into the potential of the diaspora. Leadership in Gambia need to be reinforced. I've met President Barrow. I'm very sad at what I hear, but I've got a lot of respect for him because he called me after my 2017 speech, and I had a wonderful conversation with President Barrow. Wonderful. I saw a good human being, one of the most modest politicians I've ever met. So I'm very sad when I hear a lot of bad things coming from the Gambia. Leaders, our leaders need our support. And as I said to you, the qualities that leaders need to be considered good leaders to develop their countries, I have listed them and I don't want to list them. But I think that tribalism, unfortunately, is growing and rearing its head in the Gambia, and it is sad. It goes back to politicians who have fooled everybody. We need to do something about tribalism. And that the people who can help us with tribalism actually are political leaders. I want to see, for example, the political leaders getting together once in a while. Why can they go, for example, have breakfast with the president once every three months and don't discuss politics? Ask your excellency, how is your family? And ask each other, how is your family? How is things going? How Are you OK? Don't talk about politics. Anything that will make you fight, don't do it. If the followers see that Barrow sat down with the Dabo and Hamad Ba and who else, I don't know, all of them, OK? Uh, this doy, you know, and everybody. The leaders will follow suit. But if the leaders are insulting each other, your followers will insult each other. Followers are innocent. Some, not all of them, even ignorant. They will do anything the leaders tell them, even if they benefit nothing from the leaders. As I said in Sinted, your political leaders, it's not possible. So the leaders must get together. They must forget personal differences and put the country first. Once every three months, get together and have breakfast and don't discuss politics. When you go to campaign, then you go and campaign full force as, as different parties. So tribalism, political differences, leadership, and I'm not blaming President Barrow or anybody. We are all equally responsible. We have to come together and put the interests of the country before everything. 
and even the followers have to be part of it. As I said, certain culture also influence certain leadership behavior. That is the fact. Thank you very much. Yes, Doctor, like, like, okay, let's take this final question and then we'll give you about three to four minutes to wrap up. Um, uh, this final question comes from one of the fellows and it says, what is the relationship between educational status and good leadership? <laughs> very, very tough question, okay? <laughs> It's a very tough question, very, very tough question, you know? My friend Halema Motlante does not have a university degree. And I know leaders around the world who did not have fantastic educational uh, qualifications, not only heads of state, but some famous CEOs billionaires, etc., etc. Education helps a lot, especially in the modern world, because you must know what is competition. You must know about exports. You must know about changes in technology and all of this. But if a leader has got intelligence, even if he doesn't have huge paper qualifications, and if he's surrounded by the right advisors, he can learn a lot, a lot, a lot. If he's well-trained, he knows the world, he knows what, how to make policy decisions, all these things by himself, that's fantastic. But if the leader is dynamic, he fought elections, he won the elections and he got in there, he doesn't have a fantastic qualification, but he's intelligent and above all, he's got good intention for the nation and he is able, and I repeat to this, if the leader is able to rise over his advisors, if unfortunately the leader is not very well educated and the advisors are more, much more educated, they are unscrupulous, they are, as I said, hypocritical, they are this and this and that, they will use him, they will manipulate him, no matter how good he is, he will not shine, they'll make all the decisions for him. And worse still, they will make it look like he's the one making this or this one. So you may not have fantastic PhD qualification to be a good leader, but if you are strong enough, if you are intelligent enough to learn and you have got good advisors, you may do well. But there is no doubt education is good in everything. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, doctor. I mean, uh, we didn't want you to stop, uh, but obviously we've gone, I mean, probably 20 minutes more, but I'm not surprised. Um, uh, I don't know whether Fatu wants to wants to come in now, or do we ask Doctor to just summarize, you know, with some good yeah. piece of advice yeah. before we finally come in. Yeah, so, he, can, so, he can do that. He yeah. Can do that. Mm -hmm. So, so Doctor, you have the floor again. I mean, in three minutes, three to five minutes, um, uh, um, can you just uh, wrap up, you know, your final advice, not only to the fellows, but to the whole lots of Gambians who are watching now, you know, um, all over the world. Um, uh, we have a lot of people who are connected net on our, on Facebook Live, and some of them are saying that they don't want you to stop. But let's give you five minutes. I know it's um, almost midnight. It's past midnight there in, 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 in UAE. But please, um, uh, five minutes um, that you summarize and uh, wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alaji uh, Mustafa, Jere Jeff, Ajara Mabui. Uh, I may not even take five minutes. My heart is in the Gambia. And you know it, anybody who's close to me would tell you that although I'm not a very available person, there's hardly a Gambian who is putting his pocket in the Gambia more than me. I have no doubt there are tons of people watching me who know me and know what I have do for this country and I've been doing it for many years quietly because I'm not doing it for political reasons. If anybody here asks me today and wondered if I have political interest, the answer is zero. Zero political interest. And I've got people who I grew up with who will confirm that if I had political interest, I would perhaps be the 
youngest member of parliament in the world. It was in high school <laughs> and you are smiling there that they tried to get me into parliament and I refused. <laughs> Three, four days ago, a big Mandinka brought up PhD, dear friend of mine, brilliant, top American university, top international financial institution, got angry with me because I said I'm not interested in politics. And he said, you and politics are one. No, okay, can I say it? He got so angry, you cannot believe it. It's not the first time, you know it. I have zero interest. I don't care about politics, being president of Gambia, your excellency, this and that, that, that. I have discovered by the will of God what is important in life, what is not important. I am committed to help Gambians and to help this world. And people close to know me, they know what I'm doing that I don't publicize. I ask Gambians to hold each other that life is very short. Life expectancy is bad for Gambians. Our life expectancy, about, expectancy story is about 60 years. We don't have too much time to live in this world. Let's hold each other and contribute. If you don't help anybody, don't hinder. This is my philosophy. Somebody will say, well, I didn't answer his phone call or answer his name, but nobody will say, Karamo Sonko has wronged me. I tried all my life to avoid that. Inshallah. Let us come together. What happened in the past, let it never happen. Let's be one. Let's one. Let's come together. Let the politicians start coming together and then they bring the rest of the, pop the population together. Let's talk about tribal issues and all these divisions that we have. Experience in the Gambia. We have a fantastic country. People are the biggest and the best resources for any country. We are not a wealthy country, but we've got brilliant people. We need to know how to tap into our human resources, our strategic location, etc. etc. I've got about 13 or 14 advantages of Gambia, which I mentioned in 2017, and I also mentioned in Brussels when the European Union, some of their uh, their, their senior staff said, what's in Gambia? There is global warming. There's what sits in Gambia. Gambia has got about 13 or more strategic advantages we can use. Singapore is there. It's not a wealthy country. South Korea and other countries. Gambia has got all it takes to move forward. And we must all try to work together, strive for together. Whatever we can do to contribute in our own little ways to try to move this country to be an envy in Africa and beyond. We've got it in our people. And we pray that our leaders also will be strengthened, be given the vision, the strength, and everything else that they need to be able to move us forward. That's all I want to say. Let's work as one nation, one people, and one Gambia. Thank you very much. And forgive me, ladies and gentlemen and compatriots, if I should say anything today that you didn't like or even anybody felt upset about. Thank you, Jara Mabui, Jere Jenjev, Allah Baraka. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. So, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, fellows of Tafla and whoever is watching us now, um, you've heard it from the horse's mouth. Um, You've heard it from the chairman of TAF Africa Global. You've heard it from somebody, somebody a compatriot, a friend, a brother. So um, I guess all of you um, uh, will agree with me that I have chosen the right chairman for TAF Africa Global. Actually, you've not been listening to my boss. I mean, mm -hmm. I am the CEO of Africa Global, but this is my boss. The chairman is the boss of the CEO. Uh, but not only that, I mean, I am privileged to have Karamo as a brother, as a friend. Our friendship and brotherhood probably spans over 50 years ago, close to 50 years ago. And we have always maintained this. We have um, certain things in common. I mean, I have very high regards for him. And we have now connected, even our families, they know each other. My families enjoy anytime they're in Sharjah going together with his family. I don't want to embarrass him too much, but Karamo is a brother. He's a jewel. He's a real Gambian. Whilst everybody thinks that he is far away from here, his heart is here. We talk very often when he's got time. And I'm glad that he has agreed to deliver this lecture to these um, um, fellows and Gambians at large. Alaji Karamo, we want to thank you. We thank you so much 
fellows, you've heard it again. What we expect from you is to now spread some of these lectures that you have received from this humble man. Somebody that has roamed all over the world. Somebody who has been to the highest and the, the best of universities. But you can see him, as you see him in the screen, this is how humble he is. You have a lot of lessons to learn today. Share what you have learned from him with your friends, with family, even your elderly ones. That's what this academy is all about. It's about sharing good qualities of leadership. I mean, as I said earlier, um, uh, this was about a week ago, that our objective is to produce 2,000 leaders like these fellows over the next five years. So our vision is that any position of leadership that we go to in the Gambia within the next five years will find a Tafla fellow there. And we believe this is the way that we can change our country positively. We, are, we don't believe in leading whilst others follow. I mean, I tell people that people like Karamo, people like myself, we lead from behind. We will operate like bulldozers. You know, a bulldozer is not always in front. It's very powerful, but no, the bulldozer is always at the back and it pushes. So we believe that the next generation of Gambians, which are amongst these fellows, are the ones who are going to lead our country into prosperity. Or for any Gambian for that matter, that I've heard and is privileged to hear this great um, um, lecture from Dr. Karamo Sonko. Again, Dr. Karamo, we are so grateful on behalf of the, um, uh, the fellows. Um, uh, we would like you to share your, your presentation. We will share it with the fellows. They have to do an assignment just to show that they have learned something from you and then we'll take it up from there. So again, words cannot express how grateful we are. We are grateful and I represent only, not only the, um, um, the um, fellows, but Gambians at large. So um, uh, Fatu, these were my last words. If you have anything to add, please go ahead and I will now release Dr. Sonko to go and have his well-earned <laughs> and well-deserved rest and sleep. Thank you. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Sanko, thank you very much. The man with the very impressive CV. Congratulations. Thank you. Fatu, Fatu, thank you very much. Thank you. Man. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm a very simple man. Ignore my CV. The credit for <laughs> my CV can, goes to my parents. The that. Almighty God. That. You cannot change that. It's there. So we're going to say congratulations. And uh, Mustafa and Jaisa of African Global, thank you very much. And uh, to the, the listeners, we just want to say this uh, was the first Tough Leadership Academy online session. And we'll be doing this bi-weekly. And today we will talk about the qualities of leadership. Thank you all very much for your time. And uh, for those who are not able to watch the program live, it will be still be on the page. We'll be able to take a look uh, uh, on the page. And also Tough, it will be on YouTube as well, right? It yes, be it will be. It will be. Yeah. Okay. So thank you all very much. Until we come your way again uh, uh, in two weeks, right? We'll see you then. Yes, in two thank weeks. You. Actually, thank may you. I announce, Fatu, may I announce that our next um, uh, um, speaker is uh, Mr. Usain Nungom. Um, uh, maybe some, 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 some of the um, listeners will know, will know Usain Nungom. Um, Usain Nungom is, is, a, is a Gambian who, who's just retired you know, from Accord. And um, uh, he had originally worked for Gambia Airways. And recently, actually, he has been appointed as the chairperson of, of Gambia Airways. He's an um, uh, international development and finance expert. And he will be talking on um, uh, decision making. You know, because okay. leaders need to take, take decisions. So we will, yeah, we will share, before next fortnight, we will share his CV and do the necessary promotion. So on that note, doctor, thank you so much. Fellows, I hope you learned a lot. Thank you so much. Fatu, again, thanks a million. And uh, we'll, we'll see you in the next two weeks. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Home is where the heart is. 
Home is where you feel safe and secure. Dalaba Housing Estate is the newest estate by Taf Africa Global, located strategically along the newly built Sukuta Jabang Highway. Dalaba Estate offers roads, street lights, a gated community that offers water reticulation system, solar street lights, and a proper drainage system. Over the next 10 years, Taf Africa Global aims to build 10,000 homes in the Gambia for you to own. For you to feel safe and secure in a community with all the necessities to live comfortably.